Okay, so it's a, it's a particular pleasure for me to uh, welcome and to introduce Professor Keith Brown. He's a professor of politics and global studies, and he's now the director uh, of the Malikian Center for Russian, Euro Eurasian, and East European Studies at Arizona State University. For many years before that, uh, he was at the Watson at Brown University. Uh, and he's someone I've known for 20 years. Maybe, yeah. uh, okay. Uh, and, and collaborated with, uh, and his work has just uh, gone from strength to strength and, and, and is extremely inspiring for me. He's, he's the author, his, his latest book, he's a prolific writer and publisher, but his latest book, I think, was um, a particularly um, impressive study, uh, Loyal Unto Death, Trust and Terror in Revolutionary Macedonia, uh, in which he applied really quite an interdisciplinary lens, uh, but particularly drawing from anthropology and political theory to the study uh, of, of uh, archives uh, related to the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization. And actually it was an archives of um, applications to social security or pension payments, right. wasn't it? Okay, so a very kind of creative uh, approach. Uh, he's got uh, more recent articles, um, one called Order, Reputation, Narrative, Forms of State Violence in Late Socialist Macedonia, uh, and Burek Da, Sociality, Context and Idiom in Macedonia and Beyond. Uh, so looking forward very much to, to your talk, Keith. So, over to you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Jane, especially. <clears throat> I will stay close to the mic, I promise. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. I don't feel worthy to be the keynote. Um, Jane uh, Callan, who's brought us all here, um, has been like the a relentless supporter and advocate of my work for many years, and I'm very grateful for this invitation. And of course, when she calls, I come. Um, I see that I am missing the last page of this talk, so um, so I don't know where we're going to end up. Um, <laughs> uh, I just warn you of that to start with. Um, and I uh, so I, I took the, the the frame of the keynote quite loosely. I've watched um, I've watched keynotes. Um, I've watched a lot of keynotes, and, and sometimes they're not very good. So, um, so I thought I would do something different, um, which may equally not be very good, but um, uh, it won't be as formal and as linear as, as many of the keynotes that you might expect to see. So what Jane sort of asked me to do for this, um, she's mostly already done, which is set the frame. Um, so she, so as uh, Jane introduced, I tend to work on micro uh, studies and work mostly on the what is now. So work on the history of the the Republic of North Macedonia, uh, especially in the 20th century. Um, but I'm hoping here to zoom out. Um, what what I'm also, um, yeah. So so this. Um, so this is also informed very much by a class I've just finished teaching, um, a first year class on uh, Introduction to Global Studies at Arizona, Arizona State University. And I, I bring that up because I went back and read the terms of why Jane is here, um, and it is for studies in contemporary society. Um, and it feels like with each passing week, um, the current US administration adopts a position that makes a global studies textbook feel more and more out of date um, when it talks about you know, progression towards trading, uh, keeping trade agreements rather than escalating into letting trade wars be the cause of violent confrontation. Um, and as textbooks idealize principles of negotiation and common action to address the pressing issues facing the world in ways that advance principles of equality and justice. And they just don't really resonate for, um, for students uh, living through um, a sort of daily diet of um, one of the most powerful countries in the world taking an entirely different stance on how to proceed. And so, <clears throat> so, so yes, contemporary, but 
when students, uh, when I talk to students who, who come in and say, I, you know, this is all just bewildering and doesn't all fit together, I find myself advocating for um, paying attention to longer rhythms of history and um, I find myself telling 19-year-olds just to imagine four years as a blip, uh, which of course is hard when you're a 19-year-old, but, um, but, uh, but I feel like the historical dimension is um, sort of the bedrock of thinking about the contemporary situation. Um, and then the other thing that I, the other sort of framing um, impulse that I have here is to, uh, um, having been in a lot of conversations over many years about whether interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity are even possible. Um, <coughs> political scientists seem especially skeptical of that notion. Um, but I, 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 my, my, input, my goal, which I've already failed at, was not to take pot shots at any particular disciplines, uh, but to actually sort of try and declare truce among disciplines here. Um, and so I'm going to sort of pull from a range of um, uh, disciplinary approaches to follow the conference focus on petitions and petitioning across time and space and flag uh, language in particular um, as, as, a, as an issue we need to pay attention to in different forms. And I'm aware that I'm going outside my specialism and we have um, linguistic anthropologists either in the room or en route here, um, uh, but uh, but I'm and, and as I mentioned ahead, I'm aware of how toe curling it is to hear people talk outside their disciplinary expertise. But I'm going to do it anyway. So f feel your toes in your shoes. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and by way of uh, self-legitimizing, I, I did spend some time before I found my way into anthropology as a classicist, um, interested in literature and literary study, and also some time uh, on um, sort of at least thinking about linguistic philosophy. So those are two of the things you'll hear about. Um, I also will incorporate some materials that I encountered this semester mostly thanks to conversations with graduate students. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the debt that this, um, some of the, the reason some of these, the reason I even know about some of the things I'm talking about is thanks to the work of uh, Mehmet Kasikchi and uh, Will Rector, two, uh, two graduate students at ASU, both in political science, actually. All right, so, and finish just, just by saying three master metaphors that I'm deeply appreciative of and I find increasingly um, helpful. Uh, one, the first one, uh, Clyde Cluckhorn's uh, notion of the intellectual poaching license that is the mark of anthropology. Then Clifford Goetz's uh, borrowing of Henry James's notion of the figure in the carpet to make sense of things that don't necessarily fit together, in his case, the different essays in the interpretation of cultures. And finally, um, oh, thank you. Ah, oh, look at that, wow. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Um, and finally, the, um, uh, especially in mindful of Jane's uh, suggestion that we look for, um, uh, we look for threads that run through this. Um, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein's notion of family resemblances and his metaphor of understanding that uh, I think he's actually wrong if, if you're a sailor, but his notion of ropes, ropes don't have a single thread running all the way through the long rope. They're, they're made of fibers that, um, that connect to make the rope. So, some, so, so the notion to accept that the continuities that we want to see are family resemblances uh, rather than finding some common genealogy. Okay, so uh, what's changed since the abstract um, is that I'm not going to talk about um, Vaslav Havel's Power of the Powerless or Exit Voice and Loyalty, um, which were the two texts I was planning to talk about. Uh, but I am still talking about shame um, and I'm, I'm going to present for you a sequence of cases 
um, in which the petition operates simultaneously as statement of supplication, grievance, uh, entitlement, and threat. Um, and the notion, as Jane said, that there's something specific to the, interac the social interaction that petitions prompt, uh, whereby they leave the recipient with the burden of disambiguating what's going on, what kind of speech act is, is going on. Um, so the cases that I offer, I think of as good to think with, um, coming from a span of over 3,000 years. Um, but the main sort of, the place where I'm back inside my wheelhouse of uh, expertise is a focus on um, the petitioning activities of the Union of Macedonian Political Organizations, which was composed, uh, made up of refugees and migrants in the United States and Canada. Um, and I I'm looking at the, 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 the different work, the different kind of um, transnational political activism they, uh, they were involved in uh, between about 1921 and 1934. And again, that's, this is an area where you'll see the debts to Jane Cowan's work are even more obvious. Okay. Uh, so I've got sort of four, if nothing else, I've got four um, aspects of pensions which I think are worth paying attention to. Um, first, and again, these, these reiterate things that Jane just said, the, the notion, the, the, the importance of thinking about power differentials in any petition interaction, um, especially when I say power, the, the, the power differential is in the capacity to mobilize physical force or violence. So in the contemporary world, um, oh, sorry, I should say in the 20th century world, states um, in the Weberian senses supposedly having a monopolies of internal violence um, are, are, of, are often the uh, recipient or the target of petitions. Um, but that's not always the case. Then this notion of reigning in or giving reign uh, to power, um, the opportunity that, so the, the double-edgedness of petitions or the, the two kinds of use, one where it's a sort of check um, or a break uh, on, 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 form, on the exercise of power. And this, of course, is, I think, what petitions are doing in the US First Amendment. Um, versus the way the petitions sort of give rein or, or give an opportunity for power to manifest itself or, or spread out, get comfortable because of the ways in which a petition author, uh, by, by its extension to, um, to a target, uh, to, to, to a target for petition, it's an acknowledgement of superior power in the first place. And then it also offers um, a powerful agent the opportunity to choose how to show that power, to transmute physical force into other kinds of power. Um, the third, conjuring publics and creating knowledge. Um, so w one of the things that you'll that I'm you're going to talk about is the difference between what you might think of as the selfish limited petition. Um, um, again, not a petition, but um, you know, I've lost my dog, um, and the kind of selfless petition of let's solve the stray dog problem in town. Um, let's find a solution to it. That's 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 not a good example, but um, the the point being. Uh, the, the sort of distinction being sort of trying to find a solution for yourself that leaves the dynamics of power unchanged or reinforced versus couching your petition in a larger discourse of rights or expectations. Um, and this sort of comes down to the micro level whereby if you're a petitioner, um, you're, one of the things you might find yourself doing is negotiating the ego or sense of self of the target of the petition. Um, but you, you may or may not also be trying to uh, uh, um, deliver on a larger cause and stay loyalty, stay loyal to a larger cause. So you, so there's, a, some, there's something sort of double and ambiguous in every um, successful petition. Um, 
and cr creating knowledge this um, is especially to do with um, especially sort of comes out of um, uh, I'm struck by this in particular in Andreas Glaser's book, Political Ep Epistemics, this, this second title here, uh, which is um, a really intriguing and, and rich and long study of um, uh, the knowledge production practices of the Stasi in the, G uh, the GDR and the uh, emergence of dissident networks within the GDR. So one of the cases he studies or one of the, 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 the threads he follows is the ways in which the GDR's um, philosophy of allowing petitions, um, which served the Stasi by being a source of information about dissent, um, then got, ex got taken up and sort of used by uh, the Women for Peace in particular in the 1980s. And then the last, um, the last sort of aspect is um, stagecraft and reach. Um, and in this case, uh, um, it's just sort of t thinking about petitions which look forward in time, uh, which, which imagine a positive outcome, and uh, petitions which are a focus on grievance or settling uh, or sort of addressing issues in the past. And I should also add that this entire, um, you will, you will, that th th I will be making multiple gratuitous references to the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, in the course of this keynote, which I see is not a cultural resonating point for many people in this audience. Um, so I will have to work hard on that. Um, but if you, if, you, if you were following the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the most recent um, episode, Endgame in particular, anyone here seen it? You are a very serious crowd. Um, <laughs> Okay, so in Marvel, in 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 the Avengers Endgame, um, quick. Okay, I don't want to spoil it for you, <laughs> so I won't. Okay, um, the point is sort of my point is to uh, to to sort of focus on petitions that look backwards and get stuck on trying to fix something in the past or or, or resolve it, and those which sort of move on and uh, look for creative ways to resolve. Um, a problem, um, and in, in this case in particular, I um, I would recommend the documentary film "Pray the Devil Back to Hell," um, which documents the success of uh, the women's peace movement in Liberia in the early 2000s. Um, and one of the most striking moments, and again, this is sort of the the how to bring hope to 19-year-old Americans. One of the sort of inspiring moments is when. Um, across from different religious faiths, women assemble to put themselves in a position where they're presenting a petition to um, uh, the, um, di um, the country's president, Taylor. Um, and it's a kind of reminder for students that nonviolence, methods of nonviolence, including pet of which petitions are one um, aspect, can work in even the most um, unlikely situations. Uh, so in the case of the Liberian Civil War, for example, um, a women's coalition actually pulled off the end of that war. Um, and how they did it um, is, is sort of worthy of reflection when, when things look bleak. Okay. Um, all right, and, and as, as I mentioned, so that, those are my sort of four threads, which if nothing else, um, maybe I'll stop now, no, uh, which, which hopefully so, uh, uh, may be useful uh, to us in the course of the two days. Um, and yes, um, again, to reiterate something that, um, that Jane sort of suggested we pay attention to, I want to think about the career of the petition in different national and political contexts and whether studying a sort of focus on the petition actually provides us purchase in the perennial argument that paying attention to the details of human history and cross-cultural encounters are what matter. So again, this is not a, not a, dis not a cross-disciplinary swipe, but just to sort of to advocate for um, specific case studies um, and to resist the notion that we sometimes encounter from our 
uh, nomothetic colleagues, which is, oh, you've just found another case of X, but to actually highlight the specificity of each individual case that we add. Um, and so in my case, I'm trying to, uh, the sort of bigger frame for this is thinking about what it, whether the meaning of, well, the meaning of Macedonian um, across the 20th century, uh, we have, um, there's, there's a strong sort of presentist and homo homogenizing impetus for us to only think about that as if it's um, the cognate of other national categories. Um, and I want to suggest that this, that maybe by paying attention to petitions in particular and what needs to be petitioned for in the Macedonian case, we understand that Macedonian as an adjective works differently from the seven that I inhabit, Irish, English, British, European, American, Arizonan, and Rhode Islander. So just thinking about how petitions um, drive the meaning of adjectives and, and help us disassemble the common sense assumptions that people might make about them. All right, so obviously any conversation has to start with the Iliad um, and, the, and the opening book of the Iliad. Um, so I know, so Jane's rubric sort of pushed us back a certain amount of time and across a certain amount of space. So I wanna go all the way back to 800 BC um, or 1200 BC, or whenever you think Homer is about or was written. Um, so for those of you who haven't um, revisited the Iliad lately, um, I'll just sort of set up the beginning. It's very much like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Still not working, okay. Um, okay. Uh, so the, 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 so the, the, um, the Iliad begins, right, with um, the, the, the first action we see in the Iliad is the priest of Apollo, Chryses, coming to the Greek camp um, to petition Agamemnon, the king of the, of the Greek army, to release his, Chryses' daughter, Chryses. Gets a little confusing. Um, who has been taken as a prize of war by Agamemnon um, during the extended campaign in Troy. So that's, so the, so the start, the Iliad, right, the foundational text, the foundational narrative, the thing that anyone who, anyone who talks about, um, all the various uh, reading groups that, that try to make sense of contemporary warfare all seem to start with the Iliad as the sort of great poem of war, but it starts with a petition. Um, and that first petition is an invitation to Agamemnon to perform magnanimity and generosity as a, as a leader. Um, and, uh, and that first petition fails. Now it fails to reach Agamemnon. It actually works on everyone else. So one of the other striking things about that very first petition is it takes place in public. Um, so in English translation, what we what Chryses says is, sons of Atreus and all other Achaeans, may the gods who dwell in Olympus grant you to sack the city of Priam, that's Troy, and to reach your homes in safety, but free my daughter and accept a ransom for her in reverence to Apollo, son of Zeus. So the reason I bring up the Marvel Cinematic Universe is because already right at the beginning of the Iliad, there's a nod to all kinds of other things that happen in, this, um, in the cycle of myths around the Trojan War um, that will be explored by Sophocles, Euripides, other playwrights, other writers, right? So, so right at the beginning, may you uh, reach your homes in safety is, 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 is embedded in Chryses' original sort of offer to Ag Agamemnon, which is, asking Agamemnon to be generous, but contains this um, spoiler for those of us who know that Odysseus is gonna take 10 years to get home, um, others are gonna die along the way, Agamemnon, when he gets home, is gonna be murdered by his wife and her lover. So I hope that wasn't a spoiler for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so, it's, so, so we're already sort of in this incredible, incredibly rich storytelling, but again, I, I, I wanna emphasize that it begins 
with a petition. So Agamemnon, the, the rest of the crowd, Christ is sort of, the, 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 the visuals of this um, are that he's doing it in front of the whole assembly. The most of the people there say, yeah, we should do this. Uh, Agamemnon, performing power in a particular way, says, no, I'm not going to do this. Why should I do this? Who's, who's this guy? Um, he sends crises away. But this is a textbook, textbook petition in the sense that he's got a problem. This is the person who is, is creating the problem by holding his daughter against her will and his will. And he goes direct to that, to, to, the, to, the, to the authority, to give the authority the chance to do the right thing. Um, but, he, but it's embedded in this you know, slight hint of a threat and an awareness that others in the room, in the assembly pick up that this would make sense to do this. This is a priest after all. Um, so having been sent away, crisis then goes up the chain of authority. Again, classic petition technique. You start with the person who's immediately uh, controlling your fate. Um, and, then, um, and then if that person's not going to do it for you, you see, okay, who's next up? so that I can, I can pressure this person from elsewhere. So the second petition, Crises petitions Apollo, uh, for whom he's a priest. Um, and he casts, he, he, he starts by invoking his previous service to Apollo. So he's in, in, invoking an, init, an existing relationship. Um, and then he casts the insult that Agamemnon has offered him, therefore, as an insult to Apollo as well. And Apollo responds by raining plague on the Greek camp. So um, that's where we are. And then this is where the narrative of the Iliad is a little dodgy. Uh, not dodgy, but he, you know, there's, a, there's a kind of moment where, where if people had been you know, exchanging comments afterwards about sort of plot points um, to do with the Infinity Stones in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for example, um, someone would say, well, wait a minute. He, he, everyone, he, he did this petition in public. So why are the Greeks now saying, what's bringing this plague? You know, it's, it's, it seems like a very simple equation for anyone who was there watching um, their king turn away an appeal from the priest of Apollo and then uh, the, 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 the army experiencing plague. You would think that someone would make that connection. But again, we get a dimension of this of, of, of power dynamics again, because the ask goes out in the assembly. And the Greek priest, Kalkas, um, has figured it out or has some insight, but he is reluctant to share this um, because, as he says, a plain man cannot stand against the anger of a king who, if he swallows his displeasure now, will yet nurse revenge till he has wreaked it. So before he'll kind of share information and analysis, Crises asks um, the other um, leaders, OK, someone's got to give me protection against Agamemnon before I can, I can speak the truth here. Achilles offer, um, confirms he'll protect him. Uh, Kalkas um, explains what's happening. Agamemnon yields uh, at this point. Um, so, and, I, and I haven't really included this as a petition because it's, no one actually petitions him at this point. He's sort of confronted with the consequences of his own action. Um, but he then sort of escalates or turns the, um, turns the sort of force of events by, uh, by then claiming like, well, I'm the king, I'm giving up my war prize, I shouldn't be the only one without a war prize, so I'm going to take Achilles. Uh, war prize Briseis. So he's just kind of moved the, the sort of dynamics along. And again, it's, 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 a, it's a riposte to Achilles' place in uh, defending Kalkas in the first place. So he's, so he's actually sort of playing out precisely the scenario that Kalkas sort of warns us of, that powerful men, when even after you've petitioned them and even if they've uh, if, if, they've been, if they feel like they've been pressured into something, they will find a way to, uh, or, or, or they will do f sort of fa saving face work in different ways, and it may well involve the exercise of, of power. So then we've now got a new problem uh, driving the force of the, Ili of the Iliad um, in that um, now Achilles has a problem of his own. 
And Achilles sets out to solve it. Um, and again, I don't call this first ask that he makes. This is not a petition when, you, when Achilles goes to Thetis, who is his mother, uh, to say, I have a problem. I need, I need intercession um, on your part. But then we get to the sort of the, 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 the sort of the second iconic petition that um, in the Iliad, uh, in which Thetis goes to Zeus um, and petitions him to um, intervene on behalf of her son. And in this case, the, the ask is not uh, make him give back Briseis. Uh, the ask is make the Greek army lose um, and, and give the advantage to the Trojans until Agamemnon and the Greeks realize that they need to repair the damage done to Achilles' honor. So it's a kind of escalatory ask. Um, and the description we have um, is, is here. So, and this is why I sort of refer to this as cultural origin point, the Thetis and Zeus. So she found the far-seeing son of Cronos sitting apart from the rest upon the topmost peak of many ridged Olympus. So she sat down before him, clasped his knees with her left hand, while with her right she touched him beneath the chin. And she spoke in, and depending on which translation you, you're using, people translate this next word as either petition, prayer, or supplication. So again, a sort of flag to language. Um, and the word she uses, father's use, if ever I helped you by word or deed, evoking previous relationship. Grant me this wish, honor my son who is doomed to die young. For Agamemnon the king shows disrespect, arrogantly seizing his rightful prize, again making it about um, proper conduct. Um, so sort of escalating out from my particular grievance to look at how this guy is behaving. Um, avenge my son, Olympian's use, lord of justice, reminder of the expectations that being the father, of the, the, the lead of the Olympian gods carries. Enhance the Trojans' power till the Greeks honor and respect my son and make amends. So uh, notice in this that this is a petition that takes place in private. Um, and Zeus's original answer is, uh, this is actually going to cause discord among the gods, especially Hera, my wife, who favors the Greeks. But then he, uh, she asks again, um, Thetis asks again, she signals, he, sorry, Zeus signals that he has heard her and will do so, do, will enact it. And that's where we end book one, with the stage set for um, the, the Trojan um, triumphs on the battlefield against Greece. So petitions here are operating in a world of ego, pride, and status anxiety. The agonistic world, which Michael Hertzfeld's ethnographic work on Crete illuminated so clearly for us, is sort of recognizably already here in this Homeric uh, world. Petitions are directed by priests and goddesses uh, to military commanders and powerful gods. Um, and all of these petitions are personal or individual. Once reunited with his own daughter, uh, Chryses doesn't appear in the Iliad again. He's done, right? Um, he's not concerned for the fate of other young women who've been objectified as the spoils of war or are held as sex slaves. And in similar mode, Achilles is happy, well, Achilles and Thetis are happy to have the Achaeans as a whole, the sort of whole army, pay the price as he responds to Agamemnon's insult to his standing. So there's a kind of, you know, not really a, a lot of caring about the bigger picture in these, um, in these petitions, even though there's an evocation of the expectations of behavior from the king. And then the other sort of iconic part about this is the aesthetic's bodily practice of supplication or entreaty. She places herself lower. Uh, she clasps the knees and touches the chin. And this is discussed. Um, in an essay by Roger Gould from 1973. The symbolism for supplication, this is Gould, is not arbitrary. The motivation for crouching is easy to see since the supplicant thereby asserts inferior status and vulnerability. The force of touching the knees, chin, or hands is perhaps less obvious, but is certainly not arbitrary. Uh, we note these parts of the body in particular are sacred and are thought of as the seat of the life stuff, the physical strength and the sexual and reproductive power of a man. Thus, it may be that the vital power of the supplicated is to be thought of flowing into the suppliant, or else by touching these parts of the body, the supplicant comes into symbolically aggressive yet unhurtful contact with what the supplicated most seeks to protect. 
So this sort of this sort of face work again is, is Goffman's term, um, but in this case, uh, sort of the 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 person who the, the article where I sort of found my way back to um, Gould's work in 1973 um, is a 1988 uh, 1998 article by Matthew Clark on crisis supplication, speech act, and mythological illusion, um, and what Clark does. Is draw on the draw on the language of um, linguistic philosophy, especially um, Austin's work on uh, how to do things with words, and then Searle's work on speech acts and especially elocutionary acts. Um, so, right. So this idea that there are there are there are words. It's very much English language focused, where uh, the 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 the. The speaking is the doing, right? The blurring of, of speech and action uh, is, is complete. Um, so Austin uh, divided these into five types, and he had, um, he had one category which was behabitive, which is the, I, the notion of changing the stance of the other person. Um, and Austin had dare, defy, protest, and challenge in that category among English um, terms. Searle so, sort of revised Austin's categories um, and included a category instead which he termed as directive, uh, which he explained as um, the illocutionary point of these directives consists in the fact they are attempts of vari varying degrees and hence more precisely they are determinants of the determinable which includes attempting Sorry, I shouldn't have even gone down that um, parenthesis. Let me skip that parenthesis. They are attempts by the speaker to get the hearer to do something, right? It's uh, linguistic philosophy is sometimes um, goes around the mountains. Um, they may be very modest attempts, as when I invite you to do it or suggest that you do it. Or they may be very fierce attempts, as when I ins insist that you do it. Um, Yeah, Mem uh, members of this class are ask, order, command, request, beg, plead, pray, entreat, and also invite, permit, and advise. So again, as this linguistic space that petitions operate in, uh, where there's a kind of fuzziness of the degree to which they're insistent, uh, the, de the degree, and, and so, you, so we need to sort of pay attention to the positionality of what the petitioner is doing or how they're positioning themselves regardless to, uh, reg with regard to the target of the petition. And again, this, this iconic sort of start point of Thetis kneeling, touching the knees, touching the chin, uh, sort of reminder of how a lot of these uh, categories, we, we, it's, it's, there's, there's, a, there's, an, there's a real sort of pull towards the very specific and the very concrete in our attempts to uh, make sense of them. And that, I think, is part of the, uh, but that you said, part of what goes on in the Iliad and in Thetis's appeal is a piece that um, I think the linguistic philosophers miss. Uh, because I think use, even using the lumping what, um, referring to what Thetis does here in, as with the term directive, um, sort of ignores that whole backstory that we see laid out in the Iliad of the difficulty of positioning yourself to persuade powerful people to do what you want. Because as soon as they think that, you're, that, you're, that you're, they're doing what you want, um, then you've kind of lost the battle. You have to sort of make them own it, which is exactly what Cetis does here. So the term directive, I think, is, um, um, is, is problematic. Um, but again, I think, but, and, but in order to make Zeus, um, to, to sort of have Zeus do what Thetis wants, there's a kind of shared logic of expectation about what he should do, which Agamemnon seems oblivious to. So, this, so the, 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 the beginning of the Iliad sort of takes down Agamemnon as a worthy leader right from the beginning. Um, so setting one woman free or delivering a message to a prideful king to change his actions, if not his mind, these are sort of thinkable or possible pieces of a shared language in the Iliad. 
transforming the world to question the institution of slavery or to impose checks on unilateral if, if ill-considered action are not. So in other words, there's no, there's no sense in which Thetis is, is sort of, by, by acceding to Thetis' um, request, Zeus is not surrendering any of his power. He's actually he's kind of reinforcing it by playing this particular role at this time. All right, so that's, that's 3,000 years ago. Now I want to talk about um, last month. Um, and the way, first of all, the ways in which our common sense notion of petition has changed over 3,000 years, right? So we tend to think of it as a vehicle to express people power, and we tend to focus on collective efforts. Um, and the example that, that I've been struck by recently, and again, this is to, uh, related to um, work alongside his dissertation that Mehmet uh, Kasikchi has, has been doing um, in Kazakhstan in recent months. Um, the non-governmental organization Atajurt um, uh, has been collecting testimonies from Uyghurs, uh, Kazakhs, Turks, and other ethnic minorities in China who are facing an array of repressive techniques from Beijing um, in the name of security. And this is, this is uh, the, the sort of backstory is that the, the, the Uyghur issue has been familiar and on the, on the, on the map, on, on the radar for a while, um, but two years ago, um, Beijing transferred the governor from Tibet to uh, Uyghur province and he, um, that, um, that sort of shift in intermediate authority has brought in a set of uh, more uh, uh, wider application of the repressive techniques that were being used against Uyghurs in the name of security to encompass other groups as well. So there are um, re-education camps which are effectively prison camps or concentration camps uh, mechanisms of house arrest, even if you get out of that, controls on communication with relatives or, or anyone outside the country. There's a, there's a very uh, repressive apparatus being set up. Um, and this um, NGO, Atajurt in Kazakhstan, is um, seeking to address that. Um, so as I said, uh, they've been collecting testimonies, um, they provide assistance to refugees and asylum seekers from China uh, to Ka in Kazakhstan. And they're petitioning that, as I understand it, though it's, it's not completely clear the sort of full array, a, array of tactics that they're using there, th they're collecting these testimonies and making them publicly visible via YouTube and other technologies, partly sort of as, as part of a campaign to help individual Chinese citizens petition the Chinese government, but they're also uh, bringing, they're, they're also uh, trying to um, encourage or support the Kazakh government to act on behalf of these co-nationals in uh, China. Um, and then they're also um, increasingly reaching to a wider audience. So Jane sort of flagged the um, range of sort of publics that that are involved in contemporary petitioning. So here's a, a sort of quick, sort of quick and dirty breakdown of what what Atajurt was doing. Um, and and so then the leader you saw there is uh, Sergjan Bilash. He's the um, he's the director of this NGO. Uh, so for a long time they were they 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 were encouraging relatives of people on the on the receiving end of Beijing's policy to. Um, share documents and share their stories, uh, which are then posted on YouTube. But, and that's a sort of side effect of helping those people prepare cases um, to bring it against the Chinese authorities. Then Atajurt is also trying to um, enlist, as I said, the, the aid of Kazakh, the Kazakh government, both to recognize asylum uh, seekers um, and to provide aid to refugees from this regime. The Kazakh government it is working, has been working back channels with Beijing without sort of going public. And again, this sort of public and and uh, uh, this sort of dimension of the public aspect of petitions and the degree to which um, sometimes petitions work better in private um, and sometimes diplomacy goes along back channels rather than foregrounded. So the Kazakh government has been quietly um, voicing concerns to the Beijing government um, on behalf of uh, Kazakhs at least. Um, 
Adijad, as I said, is, is also sort of reaching out to the international human rights movement in part as a sort of recognition that there are limits to what the Kazakh government is willing to do because of the larger economic and security climate of relations with China. Um, and this became manifest about a month ago, uh, two months ago now, when, um, um, when the, the headquarters of Adijad were raided and a lot of their materials were confiscated by the Kazakh authorities. Um, and Bilash was um, arrested, detained, and then released, but left under house arrest. Um, and uh, he remains under house arrest um, at this point. And so he, um, yeah, he has now, this last sort of category, um, it sort of takes the, the sort of next level of petition where now international human rights organizations are campaigning on behalf of Bilash um, uh, to, to, so petitioning the Kazakh government to release him, to drop the charges, um, and Amnesty has placed him on the prisoner of conscience list um, as of early April. So there's a range of sort of ways in which this, you know, there's clearly a lot more, a whole different world from the world of the Iliad uh, 3,000 years ago. So in the first case, uh, Atajad is using the notion of humanizing um, particular stories, so the, the choosing, um, foregrounding the sort of most charismatic, appealing, um, and clearly uh, deserving cases uh, of spokespeople for change in the world. So this, uh, this young girl is the sort of first testimony you see when you go to Atajert's YouTube link, which is a young woman asking for her mother to be released. And the text here is, I beg the world uh, to help my mother come home um, to her family. Um, so, so that's you know, there's that's going on, and in the, in the, it, it's sort of humanizing this larger, telling the individual stories that point to this larger story of repression. Um, the proximate audience is Beijing. They'll note that um, in, in classic sort of petition sense, they're not trying to. Um, they're not uh, approaching this governor uh, who's carrying out this policy. They're trying to sort of flag to higher up in the Chinese government that <coughs> the governor is, 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 is ill-serving the, the, um, the Chinese government's interests. Um, it's, it's sort of become universal. So At Atajert maybe started with a very specific Kazakh message, but it's bringing in workers, including Mehmet, from elsewhere. So it's sort of already gone out to the human rights um, world, uh, not, no longer just a Kazakh story. Um, and then, um, as I said, having been identified as a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International, the sort of petitioner has become the petitionee. Um, his release, at least, is the is the sort of main demand of uh, an open letter, another form of petition, addressed to the new Kazakh president by 10 human rights organizations uh, and available online. And the action paragraph opens, we respectfully urge Kazakhstan to grant asylum uh, to Saragul Saudbe, this was a sort of high profile case that Atajur took on, to free Sarakshan Bilash and to guarantee the freedom of speech, including freedom to criticize the systematic violations of human rights and religious freedom in China. All right, so uh, in the Iliad, it's a sort of chain of singular petitions that doesn't really build up to anything. Um, and then in those petitions, they call for harm against powerful actors. This contemporary situation shows a more entangled and complex world in which petitions are not simply one-dimensional transactions, but a part of a larger set of exchanges where, at least in the Kazakh case, they aggregate and accumulate rather than operating in competition with each other. So it's not sort of dueling petitions. Um, it's, it's, it's aggregating um, and, and ultimately more powerful uh, petitions working together. All right, I realize I've taken all my time. So the rest of this is, uh, is not going to feature now. Um, you can carry on. Oh, okay. You want to go on a bit longer. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll go faster. I'm sorry. Um, all right. So we've got two clusters of pet, uh, petitioning activity, um, two ideal types, if you like. One directed to kings and sovereigns with self-regard that needs must be addressed, an audience of one. Um, and the other more multiplex 
and more clearly towards the protest end of the petition spectrum, calling for broader, chase, broader change, not just serving the individual and trying to um, appeal to different kinds of publics. So in the rest of this talk, um, uh, or in the rest of the, the written remarks, I first of all just flag um, that petition is in the First Amendment of the United States, which I did not know until visiting a poster display um, uh, in Tempe um, of posters uh, made by uh, middle school students um, to sort of celebrate or flag the First Amendment. And we hear a lot about the First Amendment in terms of um, the, the right of p the powerful to speak, um, but I think the point of the, my interpretation of what the framers of the Constitution were doing and I think what um, Tempe high, uh, middle school students picked up on is actually it's not about power expanding its, its voice that it already has, it's actually about checks on that power. And that's sort of the spirit that, that sort of helps me understand why it is that the German Democratic Republic, as described by Glaser, actually had petitions sort of baked into um, uh, citizen rights. Um, and so the, the, the second image here is from the 1980s um, uh, uh, meeting of the Women for Peace movement. And Glaser talks about these sort of moments of petitioning as solidarity moments for the women um, in this movement. And he quotes from one of his interviews, this is on page 410 of, of his book. Uh, well, we said there's this wonderful law allowing petitions. Let's just pretend we are a house community. We're not collecting signatures here. We know that was forbidden. So, it's, so petitions are legal, but collecting signatures to do mass petitions is not legal in the GDR but we can make another petition. Then we sat down to write a common petition and we'll state again clearly what we mean. And then we just did it. There were seven women, most of them I barely knew, and we formulated a common text. And then we started to collect signatures among our acquaintances. And suddenly we had about 150 signatures and we got scared that this could be too much. We originally thought it would be just us and perhaps the one or the other woman. Yet that so many would come together because every woman said, I still know this woman and that, and that who would also sign. This was a real snowball effect. So we suddenly realized that many women were just waiting, that somebody would come along with something like this and they were happy that they could sign this. Others hesitated because they sensed that this could lead to difficulties. So Glazer is sort of, it sort of talks about this foundational um, uh, sort of moment of solidarity and the petition that they, that they wage sort of um, the, the, sorry, the petition that they then submit sort of foregrounds their identity as women, sort of, uh, sort of, sort of slicing through intersectionality and just sort of asserting this common ground, um, and it has this effect as as this um, interviewee describes of um, of sort of being a revelation. Uh, for women, rec th these women recognizing like, you know, this is a channel that the state allows. We can, we can drive down this channel in ways that they, they don't anticipate or that they haven't uh, forecast. Um, and so they, so they, so she, so Glaser talks about the ways in which these petitions um, allowed, again, in his analysis for information gathering purposes by the state, uh, because it sort of gets the, gets a handle on okay what are the what, what's bugging citizens um, uh, becomes this um, so it's allowed by the state for informational purposes but it becomes this uh, transformational moment whereby people recognize that they are not alone uh, in their grievances and then they also it sort of becomes a sort of vehicle of confirmation of their dissonant position in the sense that whenever they submit a petition which is legal and nothing is done about the petition which is the usual response then it kind of affirms to them the moral bankruptcy and the, the uh, of the of the state that they're opposing so it, it becomes this solidarity uh, confirming act even if the petition even even if individual petitions don't achieve what the what they ostensibly are meant to 
And the reason uh, that, I, that I find this, um, this, this uh, analysis by Glazer so interesting is, first of all, it helps me understand, uh, adds new layers to my understanding of the Illenden pension requests that Jane mentioned that I work, I've worked on before. Um, and in my previous analysis, I sort of, I, I sort of prioritized the, um, I, I, I was a little bit too romantic about what was going on in the Illenden dossier, Illenden dossier so I sort of imagined myself as, in, in, in some sort of um, sense, I, I imagined the purpose of the Yugoslav government in collecting this, uh, in offering its citizens this opportunity to talk about um, activities they had undertaken 40 years before. I sort of thought of them as, as helping me on my field work. Like I didn't quite imagine that they were specifically trying to help me with my field work 40 years later because that would be, that would be, um, that would be a John Malkovich moment. Um, but, um, but sort of, I really sort of foregrounded that as well. Wow, maybe the, the Yugoslav government was trying to do something like the, um, uh, like the New Deal government in terms of like providing avenues for people to uh, voice, uh, voice their participation in a larger project. Um, and I still, I haven't completely given up on that, but Glaser and others sort of flagged to me the dimensions of useful intelligence gathering that this represented, and also the degree to which we, the, the, the particular context of um, shifts in power between uh, Tito's Yugoslavia and, um, and uh, the uh, Soviet bloc, um, the larger bloc, really need to sort of factor into the analysis. But the other thing that it also flags to me is, thinking back, is like, okay, there's this tension um, present in Macedonian, in expressions of Macedonian uh, identity after World War II in these pensions, the degree to which people are sort of performing or telling the state what they want to hear about their commitment to a communist mission, um, but also they're doing that while documenting their participation in a movement that was about Macedonian autonomy writ large. So in other words, they're talking about activism which was in the name of uniting all Macedonians who, are, who, who after 1912 were divided between Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria. That's the action that they're talking about, but they're sort of forcing it into a frame which a state wants to hear about Macedonian activism serving just the current Republic of Macedonia and emphasizing its ties with Yugoslav communist solidarity. So there's a sort of m misfit that is intriguing that I, that, that thinking about petitions in the way that Jane has suggested sort of makes me want to go back to that work. And in going back to that work, I went back to what was going on after 1919 in terms of Macedonian activism directed towards the League of Nations in particular. Um, to try and to, to point out that as a uh, that, that Macedonians, as a result of the peace treaties, were in theory entitled to having um, uh, a, a range of rights guaranteed by uh, the states, especially Greece and Yuga and Serbia or Yugoslavia, and those rights were not being delivered. Um, to the people of Macedonia, to the Macedonian identified people of Macedonia, and that was the sort of sticking point, and that's the work that Jane has been doing in the um, archives in Geneva for a while, um, and I've sort of added a U.S. Um, twist to it by looking through the newspaper records of what the Macedonian political organization or the Union of Macedonian political organizations in the US and Canada asked for at each of their annual meetings uh, from 1921 until the 1940s, roughly. And I just um, you have sort of pulled out some of the sort of range of their, um, their actions, uh, their, their sort of appeals to superior powers across this period. So in 1923, um, the text of their resolution from the, the, from the annual meeting just demands action. It doesn't really say who from, um, but it's sort of appealing, it's, it's sort of going straight to this general principle and expecting this to have effect. Never have men so unblushingly defied principles of justice and human reason. They're pointing to, they're using this language to call out the governments in Greece and Serbia. 
um, who actually are the people who are in a position to, to uh, deliver on the rights guarantees that they're asking for. So they've sort of jumped over the first uh, object of petition straight away. Then in 1925, the, the uh, Central Committee protests very strongly and begs the civilized world to take speedy measures. Again, it's, it's a, a certain sort of tactical naivety here, um, because if, if, as a you know, if whoever the civilized world is, getting the civilized world to take speedy measures is not is not uh, historically hasn't been a uh, hasn't it's not a straightforward move from principle to practice. In 1926, they make a resolution to the League of Nations, so they're sort of honing in here. Uh, and they say the victors of the peace clashing their swords with contempt. Again, notice the sort of riffs off that Zeus moment, right? It's contempt, um, this unblushing defiance of principles of justice and human reason. Um, who is to punish them? So they're now asking for the League of Nations to actually be an enforcement agent against um, states that are not following through on obligations. In 1927, a very specific sort of side branch, which actually um, sort of shows a kind of lessening of ambition. Uh, the Montreal branch of the association, of, of, sorry, of the, of the organization, um, appeal, it, it makes a resolution to educators who are attending, um, I'm sorry, that makes no sense. By resolution to, so educators were attending uh, an, an international meeting in Montreal and the, the Macedonian political organization sort of urged them to interest themselves in the Macedonian question and exercise influence for its solution. So a very kind of, much more of a kind of grassroots recognition that people don't even know what we're talking about here. We're going straight to these lofty principles. We need, we need an information campaign and it needs to start where we can reach people. 1928, um, a sort of uh, a very generous, uh, the, the, the opening address of the MPO is, is, is sort of very laudatory about the US and Canada in particular. Remember, the US is not a member of the League of Nations at this time. And they're trying to explain, there's sort of, there's, it's, it's a kind of empathy inducing moment of like, we are passionate about this as Americans, as adoptive Americans who feel some sympathy for people uh, dying because they don't have the same rights that we do and you extend it to us. So a kind of, um, as I said, a, a kind of invocation to empathy. Then in 1929, an alliance building uh, move, um, but again, the ple they pledge to each other to raise awareness uh, of Macedonia and then they also want to make a tactical alliance with Croatian Americans at this point. 1930, they make a formal protestation to the League of Nations against the enslavement of the Macedonians in Europe, and they actually know who they're writing to by this point. The League of Nations has an address, and they found it, so they're going to write to Sir Eric Drummond, um, asking that the League intervene. And again, watch that language has gone from demand to ask. Uh, in 1933, they're back in the information gathering um, phase. Uh, of, their, of their petitioning, they're recommending an investigative commission. And then in 1934, an open letter to King Boris in Bulgaria, uh, demanding his intervention and punishment of officials to stop a crackdown on Macedonians, which was taking place um, in Bulgaria. Uh, so that's all of those pages. So two concrete examples from this period. So that's the sort of what's going on at the Central Committee end. Um, again, I would just want to flag the ways in which the language is changing, but, but especially you, we see this uh, clinging onto these very large principles. So, so this is a sort of a, a set of um, very passionate, um, very committed, um, dual citizens in many cases, so they, they're US and Canadian citizens uh, who've embraced what that offers but haven't given up their ties um, to their homeland and haven't given up on the notion that something went awry in the past and we're going to try and fix it. And the reason we're going to be able to fix it is because we're going to make people uh, recognize that these large principles are at risk um, in what's happened. So this is... Um, 
a letter addressed to the Secretary General of the League of Nations in Geneva 1926 from the Vice President of the Central Committee, which Jane found uh, for me in uh, Geneva, um, speaking about the principles of freedom, independence, and federation. So that's the sort of position of what these dual citizens, but sitting in the US and Canada, are up to. The situation looks a little different, and part of the way that the, um, this, this kind of notion of undoing the past uh, goes away is because people on the ground don't have the luxury of living in the world of principles. So this is a, a letter, an individual petition from Pascalev Moskov, who's resident in Bulgaria, um, a native of a, of a town in a village in Greece. Um, and I'd flag especially the, the second and, um, sorry, the, f the first and the third paragraph. He st sort of starts by saying, please intervene to establish an independent state of Macedonia. Um, and, and then he's sort of providing the, the kind of financial incentive for the League of Nations to act in that way. We'll drop all our demands. We'll just go away if you do this. Uh, as a problem, we won't, we, you, won't need to, you won't need to figure out who gets paid what for all our fields and our properties will be done. But then he says, if, if, it's, if, it's, if for, for whatever reason it's impossible for you to accede to this desire, uh, I'm honored to beg you to order the mixed commission uh, for the Greco-Bulgarian exchange of populations to send a commission with the objective of valuing my property. So he's, he's basically, he, he's made the first step of like, okay, this is what I would like, and I speak of this, and, and you know, this, this is our dream, this is our dream outcome. If you can't do that, here's my backup. Please just go ahead with what you're doing anyway, um, and I'll take the money. Um, and again, I, I, I flag this because it helps me um, sort of understand the politics around the, um, the Illenden dossier after World, War, after World War II. It's sort of been revisited as this uh, moment of betrayal of the movement for Macedonian autonomy uh, because Tito, for reasons of realpolitik, gives up on the idea of uh, bringing the Macedonians of Greece and Bulgaria into a single state uh, around the Republic of Macedonia. And the way that I think the Yugoslav government tries to, 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 to pitch this, um, again, around um, in, in response to sort of uh, the petitions or the expression of desire for something else, both by the diaspora who have the luxury of, of, uh, um, of, of advocating for the ideal situation, and for those folks in Macedonia who participated in the uprising in 1903 for this goal. I think the sort of pivot, the sort of way that the government tries to respond to this is to say, look, you, you, know, you, are, you are advocates and you fought for this maximalist goal you should recognize that what we've accomplished, that is the, the autonomy of citizens of the Republic of Macedonia, is, an, uh, uh, is, an, is a positive outcome of your efforts. In other words, if you hadn't gone maximalist, and we applaud your maximalist ambitions, but this is the best we can hope for at this point. Um, I'm gonna, uh, so, so that's, so again, that it, it, the, the, this sort of broader lens that Jane has uh, suggested that we take um, uh, and which I've tried to sort of model or, or show how I've done it in this case, I hope both flags, both the utility of going very big. So there are, kind, there are interesting resonances for me between what the Kazakh um, human rights movement in Kazakhstan is doing with respect to co-nationals in China and the work that the Macedonian diaspora organizations in the 1930s were doing with respect to Macedonia. So there's that sort of um, element of mutual information. But then more linearly, uh, Jane's uh, invitation to sort of to, to put this activism after World War I into some kind of dialogue with the world of petitions in a socialist state after World War II uh, really helped me to f flesh out and get a better handle on the, this tension between, um, between ideals of citizenship as, um, as modeled both in the, in the, sort of in the, in the US um, constitution and, 
and amendments, which is one reference point for at least some of these Macedonians, plus the ideal of people's communism in the German Democratic Republic and in Yugoslavia after World War II. So you've got a set of ideals about participation and voice um, and reach um, within states, um, uh, which, which, which in the end, uh, so, you, so I see this sort of common, th these surprising commonalities between citizenship in people's republics and in the US model, which sort of is, it opposes opposes the, the kind of more imperial rationale uh, of some of the Western European countries, which then I think informs the way the League of Nations operates. And so what I, what I feel like I end up uh, understanding better is, um, is, the deg is, is the ways in which this negotiation between uh, different generations, citizens of this new Yugoslav Macedonia in the 1940s and their later descendants, the ways in which um, they, if nothing else, the, the creation of Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia gave them a new sort of terminal um, target for their petitions where they could actually bring about political change as opposed to what was going on in this League of Nations phase where I feel the experience of these Macedonians in the US was they just felt they were, they were howling against the darkness. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I have for you. Thank you, Keith. And please, um, where shall, we, shall we sit? Or? We can sit. We can sit? Yeah. yeah. So thank you for, um, uh, I think, a very rich presentation with, which set up lots of uh, the, different, um, the different questions, the different issues, and a whole <coughs> lot of different contexts as well. But also, I mean, I think for me, a number of things. One was really the way that petitions have effects but not necessarily the effects that they, that they wish for or intend. They have lots and lots of different uh, effects. Um, the way that um, petitions uh, can be a kind of galvanizing um, process for creating new senses of kind of collective identity and collective agency. Um, that petitions work in um, not just simply on their own, but <coughs> often in concert with different forms of, of claims making and other kinds of negotiations and processes. Um, so I really love the way that you were, in your very you know, typically erudite and um, interdisciplinary way, kind of drawing from the classics, from uh, the past, from uh, China, across the world. Lots of different um, things for us to think about, and I think really you know, kind of setting uh, an agenda. So I'd like to uh, welcome questions or comments from uh, the audience. We have a few minutes before we can go and have coffee. Uh, since I'm sitting in the first uh, yeah, row, I, mean, I, I feel that I'm obliged to please, make a talk question. To this. It's a, What's it's, this? It's a microphone. That's very, that's very threatening. <laughs> it's, it's a microphone. <laughs> OK, good morning, <laughs> microphone. It's, um, it's Should I hold yeah, it? Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that's really very impressive. <laughs> No, no, I, I mean, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Keith. It was very rich and I would say very, very challenging in many respects. I will uh, just make a question uh, of uh, just of clarification or uh, a piece of information, which of course could be used as a, a starting point for a big discussion, which I'm afraid we cannot do in the next three minutes. What is that, the, if you remember the Greek word used in the Iliad, which you translate, or not you, the translator translated in three different ways. Okay, Could, do, you, do you have any uh, idea? Yeah, I, I didn't, I, I regret that I did not go back to the Greek original in the last few ah, days, so. Ah, ah sorry, I mean. I, no, no, it's, <laughs> no I, I was reminded though as I was doing my three, um, my three part translation was that that was, I was, when I did, um, well, yeah. So when I was last doing Greek translation, which is a long time ago now, uh, in, in the, the last Greek translation exam I did, I actually was 
I was deeply into Wittgensteinian, the meaning of a word as it's use in the language. And so that was how I was translating almost all the Greek nouns. Mm -hmm. I was giving like four alternatives. Mm -hmm. And somehow I, I hit upon an examiner who had patience for that. Uh, but I, but I, but what you flag is, I mean, I think as you know, it's, I mean, it, yeah. If someone says, well, what's the what's the Homeric word for petition? There isn't a Homeric word for petition because the sem the semantic divisions that we're making in English don't operate the same way in Homeric Greek. But I think that probably extends into contemporary German. Extend. Yeah, you know, I, I went back. The the, the 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 Macedonian term I translated as petition is molba, which is request um, from the Ilinden dossier. Mm -hmm. But the reason I went with petition is because in many cases the exchange between the pension seeker and the awarding state was was an iterative process, and it included the initial request. It included letters of grievance, jalba, complaint. Um, and so, you know, the whole seemed to me to amount to a process that looked like what fell inside my semantic domain of petitioning. Mm -hmm. And I feel like th that's what's drawing some people to translate this Homeric Greek word mm -hmm. as petition, because they're looking at what that just does. And yeah. it like petition. Yes, and of course, that brings us into the very core of uh, perhaps one of the main themes of this uh, workshop, which is how we define the subject matter of this workshop. And what do we do as anthropologists? I mean, who we're doing comparative work, I understand, not in space and time. I mean, you really started with an extremely challenging uh, scale of comparison, okay, the Iliad and uh, the present. So how would deal with the methodological issue of delineating the object of this workshop with uh, uh, our comparative project? Uh, so I suppose that uh, in the coming two days, we'll probably find some answers to this rather complex question. Any other question? Sarah, you had a question. Sure. Uh, well, I think uh, the, the one thing that I picked up that I found was interesting about your talk uh, was the um, the relation in the story. You began the first thing was about relations, and so the kinds of relations that are and aren't legitimate ones, and that can engage that can engage in asking for something from more powerful, and that this changes with time. So what I wondered was, actually, you also started very early on uh, with a very specific definition of power, which had to do with the control of physical force. But the implication of what you're saying here is that actually your definition of power extends rather beyond just the question of physical force, and that to have the power to even ask for something uh, depends on the nature of relations that are legitimately in relation to power, so that ac actually what your, your original definition of power sounds a little bit limiting. Uh, thank you. Is this, is this working or should I start talking? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, and uh, could, um, can you say, when you say, uh, so you, um, did I use the term legitimate relation or is that that's your, yes, yeah, so can you flag what what that distinction what that's in relation. Uh, yeah, maybe I should have used a different term. It's, uh, but my focus was really on the on the nature of the relations that could appeal to some a uh, powerful entity yeah. to act on yeah. your behalf. Yeah. And the nature, uh, and you pointed out that in the Iliad, that was a different kind of relation right. than the, the the kinds that are in the contemporary moment. I find that really really interesting. Uh, commentary, but it, it implies that the the what's powerful is not only the ability to control physical force, but what's powerful is also the field within which certain kinds of relations can be activated or engaged, and others can't. Yeah, that, um, so I, I think yes, I think that's absolutely right. I, I do notice that. I mean, the Iliad. The, the, the Iliad starts with these two cases, in both cases, um, a sort of very, a, a traditional slash old fashioned model of what is powerful is the object of these two petitions. And then I, I f f what, what is, I mean, you actually just flagged to me, right, that these, 
there are no women among the leadership of this Macedonian political organization, um, right? They're conceiving of the work that they're doing as, a, as men's work to some degree, and they are looking for the powerful, the punitive, the forceful. That, like, that's the, the recipient that they are seeking for their message and the ally they're trying to make. But I think what you're flagging, which I maybe should need to, yeah, I need to think more about is that um, yeah, that that so I want to say yes, of course, but I'm but I'm trying to think of um, I'm, I, let me let me think more about the implications of what you're saying. I mean, th yeah, I think you're. I, I wanted to start with that sort of old-fashioned model, see how it runs through, but then I think suggest in the end, like the Kazakh case, they are not trying to enlist force; they are trying to enlist a moral suasion, right? They're trying to they're trying to appeal to a moral sense, which isn't actually rooted in violence, even though they're they're responding to violence, the exercise of power on bodies. Uh, but they're trying to move it into a different domain. They're trying to mobilize different kinds of power, which involves mobil creating different kinds of relation. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we'll have um, yeah, two more quick questions. We can go a few minutes into the conflict. They've got a here. I wanted to ask uh, whether you encountered any petitions that were anonymous. I know you mostly worked with collective petitions, the Kazakh case and the Macedonian case. But, but were there, because some of these petitions involved a certain level of risk and exposure for the people who were writing, uh, did you uh, find that some people uh, didn't disclose their identities when they wrote? Um, uh, I'm just trying to think back. Uh, so I mean, I, I'm trying to think of the different Domain. So are you thinking in the Illenden case in particular, or this 19-teens and uh, 1930s? Let's start there. OK. The, I mean, Master. it sort of comes back to this prior question, right? Because the stakes, the stakes, I mean, so, so one sort of part of me wants to sort of read the, the these Iliad um, cases as kind of variants of the please kill my neighbor's cow, right? Um, which is a petition that you can make anonymously. Um, but actually most of the, the two cases that I'm looking most closely at, this Macedonian activism to try and either secure an autonomous Macedonia or get restitution for individual people, and then the pension requests, you can't sort of do either of those anonymously. Um, but the, the, the Ilian dossier does feature every so often in a, in a particular file, there might be a reference to or an actual letter that's uh, anonymous, which is, don't believe this person, they say X, and in fact, that's nonsense. And there, it's possible for the petitioner to get the work done they want without actually using their name. Right? They just want to muddy the the waters for this other person, but they're not actually trying to get something for themselves. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, we've got two questions, but I think I'm going to ask you to, um, uh, well, to state them Bundle. together, one after the other, and then Keith can answer what he wishes, and then we go on to the coffee. So, Matt, uh, yeah, first, and then I got Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. I, I was fascinating range. Please look to go. Fascinating range of kinds of government. I just wonder if you could. This is a huge question, not fair to ask right at the end. But I wonder if you could reflect on how petitions do or don't fit or operate differently in these really different kinds of political situations. Like in the first case, you have some kind of monarchy or kingly order. You have a democratic order at times, uh, socialist states, and then international bodies. Is there? Are, do, do petitions fit uh, more snugly in one or or anyway? What are your thoughts on how they how they work differently in different political setups? And let's take a God's question. And just to say, I think, Matt, this is a huge question. Yeah, not fair. <laughs> say this is a question that we should all be thinking about. Um, yeah. This, my, mine is more of a comment um, to come back to Avengers, which I haven't seen. Uh, kind of feminist 2.0 of the Iliad 
is a book uh, by a Pat Barker called hmm. The Silence of the Girls, which is probably the most powerful book I've read in a very long time, and which actually uh, uh, tells the story of the Iliad from the p perspective of awesome. the women, okay. and of especially Brise, so okay. Achilles concubine. Yeah. Um, and I think it would be very useful. Actually. Sure. Can you remind me the title again? Uh, the Silence of the Girls. And this is not Pat Barker, the novelist? It is. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Extremely well researched as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you making a commentary also on the, the transition in Avengers Endgame from the white male dominated <laughs> superhero universe to the ha I'm handing thinking, off? You know, in terms of the kind of uh, correlation you might yeah, be yeah. Uh, wanting to make. Uh, to such an audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, and then, um, no, that, uh, and th that's really helpful. I mean, I actually, I managed to kind of shoehorn um, the Iliad into my global studies class precisely with this perspective. It's like, what does this look like if you, you know, if you look at it from what we now think about gender roles and yeah. expectations? But thank you, this is great. Um, and then, Matt, yes, of course. I mean, I, I think that's, as, as Jane said, I think that's one of the draws for me about um, sort of working, like following this thread of the petition that Jane suggested to us. So one of the things that's going on that I, that I didn't know before following this is this, the, this um, I, you, you might have noticed a hiatus in, proc, uh, in statements between 1931 and 1933. Uh, from the Central Committee, and that's because in that period, um, their reporting uh, meetings are being disrupted by communists trying to hand out handbills and trying to sort of divert the energy of the organization in different directions. So there's a kind of internal power struggle, um, and I, f I feel as if the the vehicle of the petition helps us get at forms of subjecthood and how people imagine political subjecthood in different ways depending on the both the regime they're in and the regime they're aspiring to so um, and especially this um, and I, if it, I thoroughly recommend Glaser's uh, book for people who haven't read it in terms of really sort of getting a sense I feel he does a really great job of kind of um, sort of getting inside so sort of sidestepping the sort of easy tropes about what it's like to uh, live in and um, follow the rules and and carry out um, the directives of the East German state, um, he he sort of really I think puts back the idealism and the hope and the uh, and the intelligibility into people following that as well as people opposing it and so. Uh, and, and that's why I found especially this, this sort of subsection on petitions that he has is really helpful for precisely the reasons you're describing. Okay, thank you so much, Keith, for getting us off to such a good start and, and uh, sticking around.